Hi, I'm Lois Powell. And I'm Susan Schuler, And we're here to share tips, tricks, ideas, and resources to help you discover what's your story. Hey, Lois, how are you? Great, Susan. It's so much fun to come back and do another topic. It really is. Did you have a good vacation? I did have a great excellent, vacation. Excellent, excellent. Did you do any genealogy? Not on vacation, oh. but once I got back, I did. Excellent, excellent. So today's topic is finding your female ancestors, which can be a struggle, um, can be incredibly rewarding when you break some mysteries up, but uh, can also be kind of um, a challenge. And it can really be a challenge because... Most of you are probably even aware to this day, when we get married, sometimes we lose a little of our identity. But early on, when a woman got married, her legal status became what they called femme covert, which literally meant a covered woman. She not only gave up her name, she gave up all her rights, and her identity became absorbed into her spouses. So this makes it a huge challenge if you don't know the maiden name. Right. But we have some tips and tricks and ideas to help you find maiden names, um, find um, your female ancestors who maybe you don't even know they exist right now. So where do you start? Um, well, so you should start where we always start for any genealogy question. You should start at home. I say get out the family Bible if you have one. Um, call your older relatives. See if they have a family Bible you don't know about. Um, clean out the attic. If, if grandma's attic is still around, I think that go through those boxes, see what's up there. And if you heard a prior broadcast, we've said this many times. Absolutely. That's where you start. So start with the documents. But then I tell you what, I'd go back through those boxes again because I bet you weren't looking for some of those clues. Absolutely. Yeah. So what are we looking for in those boxes? We should be looking for letters. We should be looking for um, funeral cards. We should be looking at those old photographs and making sure we can identify all of those women. Um, maybe looking at their outfits and seeing if we can pinpoint the time period if we're unsure who those people are. Um, what else, Lois? Well, I'd say once you do that, you need to move on to census records because mm -hmm. you've now c compiled all the information that you know or that you think you, you know. Because you know. remember, this is family history. Some things are accurate and some aren't. But we always tell you go to the census records next. And this is still true when you're trying to find your female ancestors. Go to the census records. Can you find them in the census? And depending on the year, you'll learn different things. Sure, sure. Um, the early censuses, obviously, they just list the, the head of household. You won't find women labeled in them until I think it's 1850 is the first one. I think. Pretty sure. I, think I have to correct. listen to our previous podcast. <laughs> um, but in the 1890 and the 1900 census, they ask a mother of how many children and how many are still living. Right? They'll ask um, in the 1900 census, they ask the month and year that you were born. And the number of years you were married, which will help you um, ascertain a marriage date. Um, and also in the 1930 census, they'll give you the age at first marriage. So those are some good clues right there from the census. Excellent clues. Yeah. Excellent clues. And if you can't find them, because generally you're looking under the husband, look for the wife because right. she might be widowed. Or he might have disappeared, or he could be at war, any number of reasons. But always look for her. Exactly. And I have a great example from the 1850 census. Um, my second great grandparents are living in their household. And this is a census where they don't list family relations. So it, she's not identified as his, as his wife. And living with them and their two children is a man who's 60, 60 years old. And um, his name was John Williams. And it always kind of bothered me. I thought, well, who is this guy living with them? He must be He's got to be more than a boarder, or are they just renting him a room, or is he connected somehow? And um, fast forward 15 years, I've discovered that John Williams is the wife's father. There you go. Yeah, and but that was 15 years of work. It doesn't happen overnight. Which means you got her last name. I did. I found her maiden name, and then I found more more stuff. It was like a, um, a fire hose. Once I found that one clue, gave me like 10 more. And that's the key to finding the names. You can also look, if she's head of house, household and it's under the married name, look for a son or a daughter-in-law because that can give you information. Look for a sister, although it's probably a different surname than the household name you're looking for. But if you find sister, 
you may be going to get her maiden name. Absolutely. A real jackpot moment, in my opinion, is looking for her and finding her in her brother's household because you know you've got the surname of the, excuse me, the maiden name, the surname. So those are some really good tips you can find from the census record because names Mm -hmm. are really critical. Absolutely. And another part about names is if her name is Margaret Brown, I would be searching for her as Mary, um, I'm sorry, Peggy Brown, Maggie Brown, every um, nickname for Margaret that you can think of, I would be searching for. Absolutely. All right. So now you've gone through the census, you've collected a little bit more information and we're only giving you tips because we've given you three or four sentences on the census. Mm -hmm. So you can go back and review those, but that's a key piece. So now what you really want to do is learn about the family. Absolutely. Husbands, brothers, fathers. A favorite of Susan's. It's the fan club. <laughs> that would be it. Yes. The fan club is probably my my favorite area of interest here because I've really, I've learned a lot by utilizing it. Um, the fan club for you who haven't listened to a previous podcast of ours is your friends, your associates, and your neighbors. And Eight times out of 10, those people that are your neighbors in the next census are your in-laws because people, you didn't marry somebody from far away. You married the guy next door, right? right? Or if you didn't marry the guy next door, your sister did, or your brother married the girl next door. Absolutely. And also the church, Mm. because if you didn't marry the next door neighbor, you did marry somebody from your church. Right. Or you married your social standings, your neighbor's cousin, your neighbor's cousin. They're all connected. Absolutely. Um, And in church, those people who are, if you find a baptismal record, find out who those godparents are and uh, how are they connected to your family. They weren't just a random stranger. They were somebody's close friend or relative. The the people who witnessed your marriage um, were were close friends or family. They weren't random strangers. They were people from your church. Church funeral information is another big area. Absolutely. Funeral records. You can get those. A lot of um, historical societies I know are digitizing local funeral records as um, funeral homes don't aren't, aren't a mom and pop operation anymore. They're owned by a, a larger company. I know in my hometown where I'm from, two of the large historical funeral homes are now, um, their records are digitized by the historical society and they're online. Oh, fabulous. You could see the person who died, when they died, when they were born, where they died, where they were born, their parents' names, and it always gives the mother's maiden name. That's that's fantastic. What an yeah, opportunity. I've struck gold a couple times there. I can believe it. And all other vital records. So you have death records may give the father's name. Birth record may give a mother's maiden name. Children's birth records, that's going to give the parent's name and many times will give the maiden name. Um, we talked about marriage and death records. So there's a lot of information there uh, that would be very useful. Absolutely. I look at those marriage records with a critical eye. Where did they get married? Where's the church? Where's the place that they got married? Um, Is that their home church? What other records would be in those facilities or online in those records? Who were the witnesses to their marriage? Who married them? You know, did that did that reverend or priest or whoever marry other people? The justice of the peace. Did he marry other people in your family? Right. Are there records for him? There's also um, newspapers. Oh. A real gold mine, right? Absolutely. In the late 19th century, just so we know, there were marriage and death announcements. So it's not just the basics, but they're also in women's interest pages. Yeah. What they call the gossip and society news. Where you learn so much. Where you learn so much. And I'll give you an example, and I know you have one too. In, In 1911 newspaper, I found I was looking for a member of my family, And I knew her name was Mary, and I knew her last name was Grass, but I could not find her. But I found in the 1911 newspaper that Mary was 17 months, and there was an article that said Mary Grass was located in Gary, Indiana. Buffalo Girl arrived safely in Indiana City, but disappeared again. Well, it turns out the police came and talked to the parents, And eight months prior, Mary, at 17 years old, made the acquaintance of a young man. And see, I never knew his name. So I didn't know what this was. The article states, and I love this wording, the two were much together (laughs) and frequently attended dances and other entertainments. Uh Uh-oh. Sometime last July, according to her mother, he left the city and went to Gary, Indiana. 
and her mother happened upon one of the letters that Mary had left behind. In it, he pleaded for her to come to Gary and they would be married. Mom, of course, turned the letter over to the police. Well, they did find her. They did bring her home in 1911. But now part two of the story. I found another article in the 1912 newspaper in the Gossip and Society News. And in that, quote, a shower was given in honor of Miss Mary at the home of her aunt. And it talked about her wedding shower, the flowers, the dresses. And yes, she married that same young man. And now I had his name, which I didn't have before. And they stayed married for the rest of their lives. Love it. I really like these society pages. Sometimes I'll just flip through my hometown newspaper. Um, they really are the social media of their day. Um, I saw an article once, a little snippet about um, there was a very late um, bad snowstorm in my hometown, a late March storm, and um, the garbage men were on the truck uh, collecting the trash and plowing simultaneously. And the article was about how the mayor was really mad because there was a little old lady down the street where these garbage men were falling off the truck really drunk because she was running out and giving them whiskey to keep them warm. And um, unbeknownst to the mayor, that was his mom. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> who was my great-grandmother. Oh, even better. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Never met her, but heard she was 90 pounds of dynamite. So you see... Social media has nothing on right. that time period. Yeah. They had their own version of it. Yeah, but that's a story about a female ancestor you can't find in a record. That you is know? right. you got to find that just serendipity. That's absolutely right. There's also things in the newspaper to look for as well. Look for unclaimed mail. They used to list it, and they would say who had unclaimed mail in the early 1800s because local newspapers would advertise it, particularly when there was unpaid postage. Oh, sure. Um, and so it applied to males and females alike. So you might find words like a list of letters, letter list, letters for you, uh, usually done in smaller local newspapers. Mm -hmm. But you can find out information there. Another one, one of my favorites here, notices repudiating wives' debts. <laughs> so what does that mean? Well, it means very simply a husband might place an ad stating that their wife left them and they're no longer responsible for any of her debts. Yeah. So if she runs up something at the grocery store, don't come to me asking me to pay it. Yeah. Uh, this started as early as 1656. And believe it or not, in small towns, it continued until the 1980s. Really? You may not think it gone that long, but it did. Wow. So search in the classified ad section or special notices. Um, just a little entertaining note. They would use the phrase eloped from my bed and board. Oh. Ooh, you know what that meant. <laughs> So you'll find full names, maiden names, again, year of divorce or separation, location. Social media really did exist in those little newspapers. Mm -hmm. So, Susan, why don't you tell us, where did we find all these old so newspapers? These newspapers, you can find them at the Library of Congress, right? They have a, a lot of local newspapers all, from all over the country. Um, Newspapers.com, a lot of researchers are familiar with. Also, Genealogy Bank, people are familiar with. Um, Ancestry.com does have some newspapers listed there, as does Family Search. Um, I think that if there's an area that you're searching, you should um, look for the newspapers in that town and see if they've been digitized or if a local society has taken them on. And I've had a lot of luck with the library from my hometown has just taken, uh, they got a grant to digitize all of these papers going back to the 1800s. And that's where I've gotten a lot of this information and things like Mrs. Millington spent the weekend visiting from Jersey city, visiting her aunt Clara bell. And that helped me learn that Clara's sister, Mary's daughter married Millington in Jersey city and just to help make connections. Perfect. And yeah. entertaining to read. Oh, they're so fun. They're really fun. Yeah. All right, another area you can look for is military pension files. Oh. Widow pensions of 1812, the Mexican War, the Civil War, the Indian War, the Spanish-American War. Women could file not only for the husband, but if they'd had an unmarried son who died or war-related in injuries, they could file. And they had to send in marriage records to prove it. Or I've seen some where they just ripped the pages out of the family Bible and mailed them in. So don't avoid the military pension files, also military records. Um, my mother-in-law, her official record lists her as second lieutenant. Her military occupation was listed as nurse general duty. And hmm. she was decorated with several med medals, and I know when she was discharged. So 
women were in the military. People will say, oh, women didn't have occupations. Women had occupations early on, and it wasn't just military. They were milliners. They, they did many, many things, and you'll find them in newspapers. You'll find them in ads. Mm -hmm. You'll find them in military records. Especially if you have an ancestor or a, a, rel a relative, like maybe your mom, who was um, a late teen, early 20s, um, right when World War II started. All of those women were in the wax, or they were doing nursing school or something to help the war effort. Absolutely. And then, of course, cemeteries. I think everybody remembers to, I hope you all remember to check cemeteries and cemetery tombstones. But check the surrounding cemetery mm -hmm. stones because a lot of time, just like the fan club, this is where family you'll find buried. Absolutely. Grandpa bought the plot and gave one to each kid. And then they could have three or four people in there with them, especially those big cemeteries like your Woodlawn, your Calvary, those big, big cemeteries, big cemeteries. in urban areas. Probates and wills. No, oh, yeah. And that's a that's a big one. Yeah, that's a huge one. I think you have someone with I do. Jacob Rose uh, left money to um all of his sons and then all of his sons in law and listed, you know, um I can't think of one off the top of my head, but um Bob Smith, who was daughter uh, married to my daughter's wife uh, husband of my daughter Mercy. You know, so that that's a good connection right there. You know, that that was her husband, that he was not in that will just because he liked him. He was in that will because he was supporting his daughter. In my case, my great grandmother's, um, there was a probate record because she was head of household at that point. Mm -hmm. Husband had already died. And uh, the example I have is I found the signature of her children. And one of them was my grandmother. Now, that's very cool because it's probably mm. the first time not only did I see a signature, it's the first time I probably saw the name spelled the way they say it should be spelled. Huh. So that was pretty cool. And yeah. I, of course, sent that on to all the family so they all could look at the name. It's so exciting when you make those, those discoveries. Those little discoveries. It's the reason that's we right. do it. <laughs> all right. Another category, deeds and land records. Mm-hmm. A woman may have signed a dower when her husband sold his land. And what's a dower? It's a real estate interest um, intended to protect a spouse who does not hold title. So what does that mean? It means that if your husband died, you can, if you had signed a dower and he sold the land, you as the widow can live on that land for the rest of your life. And then it reverts to whoever he sold it to. Or it could be she could live on the property for her life, and then because of the will, it goes to the son or the daughter. Yeah. So that's a dower, and you'll find a lot of information in deeds and land records. Neither Susan and I have had a lot of luck with land records, going to be honest with no. you, but there's quite a bit of information yeah. there that you can find. I think people have a lot of luck with land records when they have um, ancestors who were pioneers. My ancestors lived in New York forever. They didn't go anywhere, <laughs> you know, you know, it's, but if you had people who were in o, um, um, New York and then moved to Ohio and then went out to Michigan, those people seem to have a lot of land records, the people who um, settled the West. But check, there's another Absolutely. angle there. And finally, social security application. Oh, good right. one. The applicant's name, as well as the maiden name of the parents are going to show up. Mm -hmm. The other place to look for women, I think, are, are their clubs that they were in, their memberships, like the DAR or even local, like a, the church auxiliary ladies club, you know, especially if they um, put out like a church history or a town history or a church cookbook. Absolutely. And, and you know, when you start this thing, whole process, you think I'll never find a female ancestor, but we gave you so much information. This is a whole nother angle. Mm -hmm. You don't think about cookbooks and all these little historical areas, um, memberships. I found my my own mother in a membership of the Eastern Star, which oh. I didn't know she was a member yeah. of, but in that I found a lot of information. Just gave me more story about her that I'd never had before. So clubs, directories, members, and you know, again, this idea that women didn't work outside the home is such a huge misconception. Um, there's been books published like Who's Who since 1898. There's okay. Who's Who of American Women. It's a woman only directly published since 1958. 
Boston has been publishing female-specific business directories since 1903. Wow. Washington, D.C. has been doing the same thing since 1931. There are trade-specific directories for medical and legal fields that have been around since the 18th century. So really start thinking about clubs, memberships, directories, any piece of information, again, going back to those boxes in Grandma's Attic that you maybe have heard about but thought didn't think anything about it, said, oh, yeah, yeah. Go back yeah. and do some more research around that area of it. Church-related clubs, um, municipal-related clubs. I know um, I can think of my great-grandmother and then her her mother uh, did a lot of civic things, like um, charitable things in the community that yeah, weren't absolutely. necessarily church-related. Um YWCA. YWCA, sure. Um, city directories. You know, you could see for years the man listed in the city directory. And I have a um, my second great grandfather's sister lived in New Orleans. Um, and her husband is listed in the city directory every year with his occupation and contact information until the year he dies. And then the next year she's listed in there and it says teacher. Now, I had no idea that woman worked out of the home or that she was a teacher, you know, so that was a wonderful clue. That's great because again, you wouldn't have known that nope. because her identity had been absorbed into him. Yeah. But once he passed, boom, there she was. Yeah. Um, there are also, and I think we might've mentioned this earlier, state, county, and even town histories have been recorded, some digitized, some not. And especially English counties in the 1600s. I'm going beyond the United States now. Sure. I'm going out into Europe. Germany. I'm German. German had, and I'm going to not be able to pronounce this, but <laughs> we'll use them as OFBs. And it's like Orts Familia book or something of that fact, but it's basically family registers. And in every town in Germany, the family was registered. Not just the family, but all the information about the individual and every person, when they married, when they died, what they did, were they in good standing? Um, by the way, Family Search Wiki has a lot of that information. If you go out there and search for OFBs or parish registers, you'll get that. I found a marriage record back in Buffalo in 1890 where my great-grandmother's place of birth was listed. And when I researched that, um, I wrote to the person, the mayor there, turned out we were related. <laughs> Uh, so much, seven, seven or so again, or so again, things take time, be patient. He wrote back and he gave me the OFB for that town. It included my entire family back to the 1500s. Wow. It was a stroke of luck, but I now know every person that was there, every child they had, when they married, when they died, what they did what they owned, how many animals they might have owned. And in Germany, if you moved, you had to register in the next town so you can pick up that same information. Now, it doesn't all lead to successes. In that same OFB, I found my two times great-grandmother. I found everybody else. And in 1830, she was born out of wedlock. Mm. And the paternity was disputed. Ooh. So I did find that. The outcome, she was given her mother's surname. Therefore, to me, that's the end of the story. Yeah. That's a permanent roadblock. So you can go so far, but those are huge articles. So think outside of the United States, too. If you say, oh, but my grandparents came over in, like, 1890, fine. Go outside of the United States and look at those local histories there. Absolutely. And we know for a fact European cities are great record keepers. Great record Look keepers. at the rich history you've discovered. Um, talking about going global, you made me think of passenger lists. Passenger um, lists. And when you look at um, on passenger lists, use your um, female ancestors' maiden name when you can because lots of times there are cultures where they, women keep their maiden name. I can think of specifically Italy. If you're looking at Italian passenger lists, I bet your great-great-grandma came over with her maiden name, not her married name. That's a, that's a really good point. And when you talk about different cultures, there's Indian, mm -hmm. an American Indian, there's black. Keep in mind the National Association of Colored Women was established back in 1896. Wow. So there's whole kinds of memberships out there that you can look into if you think about your own cultures and your own ethnic backgrounds. I'll bet you'll find some information. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Well, there's a whole other category we haven't touched yet. Your favorite. 
One of your favorites. Well, I don't know about it. My favorite, institutional records. Mm -hmm. This is an area that you really need to think about, and I'm sad to say it's a part of our history I'm not very fond of, but insane asylums, uh, sanatoriums, and I think I've mentioned this in a, private, in a prior broadcast, but a husband had the right to put a woman in an asylum regardless of the, any reason. Could have been postpartum depression, menopause, disobedience. She looked at him cross-eyed. I don't know, but mm -hmm. he had the right to put her in an asylum. So be sure to look in that local town or city for those types of facilities, as well as hospitals. And unfortunately, hospitals, we all know, have frequently changed names. They've been bought out. But try to track that back and look for the married name, but also look for the main name, because sometimes they got put in there and they didn't get put in by their married name. Um, there's all kinds of information that you can look for date of admission, marital status, occupation, duration of insanity, cause of insanity. It's a, it's a big category, folks. It sure is. Settlement house records. Uh, they were established throughout the U.S. to connect the middle class to the low income who shared living space. So in the 18th and 19th century, look for settlement house records. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's local libraries, by the way, of settlement houses that you can look for, particularly like in Illinois, it's Hull House in Chicago. Oh, sure. Uh, Minneapolis has a federation of settlement records. Another, another whole area that you probably haven't thought about. Yeah, there's, there's, there's a will, there's a way out there. Uh, and finally, from institution, another big one was tuberculosis. Look in sanitarium records for tuberculosis. And those are mostly kept by historical societies. I think two more things we should we should at least mention, if not if not we don't have time to talk about, are adoption records, and then of course, um, if you've um, taken a DNA test, uh, I would definitely search your DNA re results for maiden names in your family that are important to your family, and then um, if you know you have a um, adoption records, are more and more states are opening their records, their historic records. I know New York just did in 2019, I think. Um, and other states are starting to follow suit where if you have a mystery like that in your family, yeah, records are attainable now. Yeah, and adoptions can be a really tough category. Absolutely. I know very little about it. I, I know very little about it as well, but I was just contacted, as a matter of fact, just this week um, through a DNA match that said we were second cousins. Mm. Their tree was closed. I contacted the person and said, you know, I think we might be related and we shared names. And she was so excited because her mother had been adopted, and we believe now, and she's digging into the records, that her mother's um, parents were my cousins. Wow, very exciting. So, uh, but it's a hard category to sure. break into. It is. So, and we, as Susan said, we don't know a lot about it, but definitely look into adoption. Yeah, see, there's always something to learn. That's the, the trick with this, is there's always things to learn about. Right. And DNA is a lot, a lot of things we need to learn about as well. Absolutely. Yes. So I think we've given you quite a few tips and ideas on ways to really um, drill down your female ancestors, learn their names, learn their lives, and um, keep researching and we'll be in touch soon. And if you have any questions, you can find us at Eastlake Community Library. Give us a call. Come on by. We're here to help.